Uh, so good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Nancy Birdsall, the president of the Center for Global Development, and we're quite thrilled this morning to be hosting the launch of uh, the Development Cooperation Report, or the DAC Report. I don't have the exact name. It's terrible in my head. Um, in a few moments, I'll introduce Eric Solheim, who is the chair of the Development Assistance Committee. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to say a word about the role of OECD in the world and why at the Center for Global Development we think the OECD matters a lot. Um, some of you might know that one of our, I think, founding board members, or uh, at least an early board member at the Center was Angel Guria, who is currently the uh, Secretary General of the OECD. And uh, I hope someone will pass on to Angel my congratulations for all that he has been doing in the last five, six, seven years since he's been there. I ask myself, is it a coincidence that this head of the OECD is from Mexico, a developing country, and that he has uh, strengthened the role of the OECD in thinking about and working with the emerging markets in particular and trying to bring them into the OECD? Uh, the OECD, as some of you might know, started as a club of equals uh, in Europe and the US around the Marshall Plan. It's actually quite interesting. So the history, it's embedded in the history of the OECD that it is in part about what we now call uh, overseas development assistance. And we have observed at the OECD uh, an approach of peer review that is absolutely critical to a world that's uh, getting more globalized. Uh, we see that in the Education League tables of the OECD. Uh, we see it in the work on BEPS. Some of you might know what that's about, base erosion and profit shifting and tax cooperation. We're working hard on that here at CGD to ensure that that work and subsequent work makes a difference not only for reducing tax evasion and tax problems amongst the advanced economies, but amongst uh, all of the developing countries as well, and between developing and the rich economies. So today, we have an opportunity to hear from uh, our colleagues at the OECD on their development cooperation report. And what's interesting about this year's report is that, and recent reports is that increasingly it's not the dry statistical compilation of how much aid there has been. The development cooperation report has become a much broader look at the full array of ways, directly and indirectly, in which the rich world affects the opportunities for prosperity and inclusive growth in the developing world. And we like that a lot at the Center for Global Development because that is also what we're about. So it's, going, it's more and more about trade and environment, investing in global public goods, increasing and improving private direct investment, leveraging private investment for inclusive prosperity, the whole range of issues that I know many of you are fully aware of. Now I want to introduce uh, the, the key person for us uh, in the development community who is now the chair of the DAC. He's key in not only the sense that he is a former Minister of Development Cooperation, or it's called International Development at the time, but he was the Minister of Environment and Development Cooperation. And for me, that makes him a kind of symbol of the changing, the shift in the challenges as we see it in the world for developing countries and for the world, which is that we're all in the same boat, and that there are a lot of global public goods that matter for people in the rich world and for people in the poor world as well. And Eric Solheim kind of clarifies that in a way that's very, uh, very important. He was a leader in the creation of the RED and the RED Plus, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest deg degradation. And we will be hearing a little bit more about that. After this event, uh, we're having some discussion of why forests, why now? With that, let me ask you to applaud Eric Solheim for what he has already brought us and give him. Actually, 
<laughs> he's not actually coming up yet. There's going to be, if I understand it, a video, and then Eric will be presenting, a minister, former Minister Solheim will be presenting the report. Discussions at the United Nations General Assembly have made it clear that the new Sustainable Development Goals will integrate social, environmental, and economic objectives. This is a much broader agenda than the MDGs, and one that applies to developed and developing countries alike. It embodies new concepts and ways of working for development. Such a holistic and ambitious agenda requires financing to match. As this development cooperation report demonstrates, the money is there. In 2012, the share of global foreign direct investment to developing countries far exceeded that of developed countries, comprising 60% on average of international capital flows. Institutional investors from OECD countries provided 83 trillion US dollars to developing countries in 2012, making them a major potential source of long-term financing. Tax revenues already constitute an important part of developing countries' GDP, but they can contribute much more if mobilized effectively. For example, in 2012, African countries as a whole raised $527 billion in taxes, 10 times more than they received as Official Development Assistance, or ODA. The Development Cooperation Report explores these and many other resources that could be tapped to finance sustainable development, including philanthropy, funds raised by NGOs, and South-South cooperation. The challenge now is how to mobilize these resources to finance sustainable development post-2015. In this scenario, the role of ODA depends largely on how it is used. In 2012, nearly $135 billion was provided as ODA to finance sustainable development a record high, yet this is relatively little in comparison to the funding challenge. This report argues that ODA will continue to play a crucial role. It shows a number of smart ways in which ODA can be used to make the most of other resources for sustainable development. ODA can offer solutions to countries most in need where options are few and risks are high. It can be used to leverage other resources, and to attract private investors by sharing risk. ODA can promote innovative financing that has the potential to generate as much as $635 billion per year, compared to the $1.9 billion raised for development today. And it can support policy reform for better investment environments and mobilization of domestic resources through taxation and control of illicit flows, for example. The time for ideas and action is now. The details of the post-2015 development agenda will be fleshed out over the coming year. This development cooperation report provides key recommendations on how to get started on financing those goals and how to move on and make progress in this journey that is a challenge to all countries and actors around the world. Thank you so much, Nancy. And of course, uh, why I'm here is just to tell you that you should go back home, spend the weekend learning everything, <laughs> reading everything, and remember every figure from this brilliant book. Let me make a suggestion. If, if you want to remember just one figure, I mean, there are thousands of useful figures in this book. If you want to know exactly what, say, Poland does, look it up here. But if you want to take the big picture and remember just one figure, I suggest the following, 390, 390. What is that? Any suggestion? That is how much richer the average South Korean is today compared to the 1950s. The average South Korean is 319 times richer if you measure GDP per capita in 1953 and GDP per capita today. Three 190 times. It's absolutely astonishing. Maybe with the exception of Singapore, I haven't compared, 
there is not, nothing like that in the world. But there are very important lessons from it. One is that there is hope. Because the, you wouldn't find one single political scientist in the 1950s who said that Korea is where, the, where there's the biggest hope. They all said this is a doomed nation who, who cannot achieve anything if you look in, into it. It's hope. Every nation can do at least something similar. And it points to what is the most essential for development, making the political decisions right. When the Koreans have a sister nation up north, same culture, same religion, same history, same everything, even much more raw materials, except getting all the political decisions basically wrong versus, by and large, getting the political decisions right. So it's all about politics. It's, at the end, not about money. The most important issue is to get the political framework for any nation right, to have good leadership, to set your nation on a really development track, but then if you can do that, resources helps. We are living at a time where there is unprecedented progress on development. When you watch the ISIS group on TV, or if you see uh, the tragedy of Ebola in West Africa, for sure you would think the, all, all, otherwise. But the last two decades have been any comparison been the most successful two decades in human history. The average human being is much better off than at any other point in human history. We have halved absolute poverty in the last two decades. We have halved uh, uh, child mortality in the last um, two decades. And just to give you one figure, uh, the number of lives saved by Ethiopia alone, because of lower child mortality in Ethiopia, is many more lives saved than all dying in all global wars combined. But for sure, they were not, are not, were not dying in one big event. They were dying one by one in the cabins or huts all over Ethiopia. So there is huge, huge progress coming from uh, this uh, political leadership in many nations. But there are also progress because much, much wider and better resources have been put to use for development. And that is the topic of this report. And for sure, if you want to accelerate the progress where there is progress, and if you want to assist those nations who have not been so successful in starting progress, it's useful to think of what other resources are available. And by and large, there are three. There are others, but by and large, there are three. Number one, and the most important resource nearly everywhere, is domestic resources in the form of tax and other domestic resources. Even in very poor nations, that's much bigger than any foreign source. I mean, we, when we watch the debates in our own community, we get the idea that the person who's providing for, develop, for education in the world is, say, uh, Anthony Lake in UNICEF. Great man. But no, I mean, the amount of development assistance for education is in the range of one hundredth of the amount of tax for education in developing nations. So obviously, if you can get tax collection better done, provide for a better domestic resource mobilization, it can have potentially enormous impact on development. Even 1%, a 1% improved tax revenue in developing nations will give $300 billion, double all aid for education, health, whatever you, you need. But this cannot only be confined as a developing nation problem. It's also about illicit capital flows. Uh, it's also about stopping the tax havens. I mean, the Br British Chancellor uh, Osborne once pointed to the fact that three great American companies, Starbucks, I'm, I'm a fan of Starbucks, but not when it comes to the tax policies. Starbucks, Google, and Microsoft were not paying taxes in the United Kingdom. Everyone understands if they're not paying taxes in the United Kingdom, they're not also paying taxes in Burundi or Cote d'Ivoire. I mean, that's a, that's a no-brainer. No so if we can get the global issues here right, there will be an, an even much bigger resources for development, as Nancy also said. This is a key issue for the OECD, base erosion and profit shifting. That is the very bad habit of some companies of putting the profit where the taxation is the lowest, or even moving it around in, a, in such a complicated manner that no tax inspector can really follow it, and you are not paying tax at all. Tax should be paid where the production is happening. So, 
We should focus in on this, getting more public resources, both globally and in developing nations for, uh, for, the, uh, for development, if we want to accelerate progress. Second is the private uh, flows. Uh, don't, I mean, don't get it wrong. For sure, you can easily find companies who exploit natural resources in a wrong way, uh, who destroy the environment, uh, or who abuse their uh, employees. I mean, it's easy to find these kind of examples. But by and large, private investment has been an enormous force for good. All the success stories like Korea or China uh, or many others, Vietnam has been able to tap into the forces of the market and all the real success stories of development have unleashed the forces of the private sector. So the issue is then, can we use development assistance in such a way that it makes it easier to do more and better private investment? Can we use development assistance to take some of the risk from a private investment? If you give a guarantee for a private investor, it may be more easy for her to invest in, say, the Central Centra African Republic. I mean, everyone understands that it's much easier to invest in Brazil, which is also a developing nation, than in South Sudan. Um, but if some of the risk were taken by aid budgets, it may also be uh, possible to invest in the least developed countries. I have one example here. It's the fact that since the 1990s, there's hardly constructed any hydroelectric power plant in Africa. Potential is enormous. Market in principle is there. But the private sector could not simply get this done alone. I mean, you think, why doesn't the market forces solve this problem? Well, for 30 years, it didn't happen. So let's learn from it to look into how we can use public-private cooperation like Obama suggested in his Power Initiative, uh, Power Africa Initiative, to work together in a new and smarter way. But there are many other areas here. We can use public money to have conversations with the private sector as to what are the conditions under which more investment will go to the difficult places. How can we facilitate more trade? Why are there so limited intra-African trade? There is huge intra-Southeast Asian trade, but there is very limited uh, intra-African trade. What are the blocks which stops this and how can they be overcome? For instance, in a cooperation which we have with the, between OBCD and World Trade Organization. But I mean, there are many ideas, but the main issue is how do we better uh, solve the crossing points between the private and the public sector so that we can get more and better private investment. Private investment today is about four to five times uh, official development assistance for the least developed, uh, uh, for developing countries. <laughs> then the third force, public money, private uh, investment, is ODA. ODA must be done, used more strategically. ODA to me has been a huge success story. In this book you will find an article by the Korean Foreign Minister, Mr. Yun, who explains how Korea tapped in to, uh, uh, foreign, uh, uh, to ODA. Not all that ODA was given just by, uh, from a solidarity perspective. A lot of it was given by the United States of America as a part of the Cold War. But the Koreans were still able to use this money uh, to uplift uh, uh, the nation. And Korea has been one of the biggest recipients of ODA of all nations in, in, in the world. So ODA has been a huge success story. But we need more of it, and we need to do it better. More of it. Basically, for the least developed countries, they have much more limited access to capital. Least developed nations, they, yes, there are private investment there, but much less than in the middle-income countries. Uh, they can do domestic resource mobilization, but everyone understands that it's di more difficult to get the tax base right in the Central African Republic than in, say, Turkey. Uh, so they have more limited access to loans to nearly all uh, other uh, financial instruments, so they need ODA more. So we're looking into, can we have more targeted instruments to make certain that more of the ODA uh, ends up in the least developed countries? And I think we will make an action plan from the DOC with the aim that half of all the global ODA should end up in the least developed countries. Not necessarily half of the individual contribution from every nation, but half of the uh, combined uh, ODA. And then for the middle-income countries, uh, the issue is not necessarily more aid, but smarter aid. 
Can we use ODI better to provide for tax revenues? Uh, put up tax inspectors without borders, uh, tax for development, programs to assist that, but also which I think will be a uh, very important discussion later uh, here today. How can we use ODA with middle income countries in a smarter way to provide for the necessary uh, green shift uh, into uh, uh, environmentally friendly uh, practices? Uh, here uh, may not necessarily be the big money which is needed, but the technology transfer to set up the good systems to assist those leaders who really want to, uh, to do the transformation. I can spend half an hour giving you practical examples. I'm for sure my friend here can, can add to that. There are so many developing nations which are now stepping up. No one can claim that overall developed nations are more responsible in the time of climate change than developing nations. Uh, there, is a, there are a huge number of positive examples. Can we use ODA to get more of that and support those nations better? So, to end on an optimistic note, uh, forget this negative impression of the world which you always get when you, uh, when you watch TV. True, there are huge negatives which may undermine some of the positives. Climate change is one of them. Our ability to live together, Christians and Muslims, Nuers or Dinkas in South Sudan, seem to be very complicated and we have huge challenges on, on the planet, for sure. But overall, we have provided enormous uh, progress and the issue is how can we take that progress to the ultimate uh, goal which is, which is that in 2030, there are other goals as well, but uh, maybe number one goal, in 2030 no individual on the planet shall be left behind. There should be no uh, uh, extreme poverty by 2030. Very ambitious, but doable. Thanks, Nancy. Please come on up and I'll, I'll introduce you. It, we have uh, a, an intimidatingly smart and accomplished panel. Um, and what we're going to do is um, I'm going to ask them to say a few <coughs> words and then I'm going to open up to, to you, the audience. Uh, um, so, it's come up. Um, so let me introduce from my far left, um, Stephanie Miller, uh, Director for Western Europe at the IFC, which as you all know is the private sector financing part of the World Bank. Uh, she joined IFC as a project manager in Belarus and Ukraine uh, and has had a varied career. Is that right? Many years ago. Many years ago. <laughs> uh, has a varied career working on global infrastructure deals, manufacturing and services. And before that, uh, worked in the US Department of the Interior on environmental and conservation issues. Um, uh, next is um, Naoko Ishii, who is the uh, CEO and chairperson of the Global Environment Facility which, again, as you all know, provides grants for projects related to the global environment. Before that, she was uh, Japan's Deputy Vice Minister of Finance, where she was responsible for Japan's international finance and development policies, and for global policies on environmental issues such as climate change uh, and biodiversity. But many of you in the room here will know her from her time <coughs> here in Washington at the World Bank, where she was, amongst other things, country director for Sri Lanka and the Maldives, and uh, for her time as an economist at the IMF. Um, you're very welcome. Um, Bruno Wen is the chairman of DEG, which is the German Investment and Development, Cor uh, uh, Ger Investment and Development Corporation. So that's essentially the German equivalent of the IFC, right? That's good. <coughs> uh, but it's, it, which is part of KFW. Um, uh, Mr. Wen has um, had a long career at KFW, having uh, before that worked for a couple of years, I was interested to see, at the German development think tank, DIE, um, which is uh, a partner of ours here at CGB. Um, State Secretary uh, Thomas Silberhorn is uh, the Parliamentary State Secretary to the Federal Minister of Economic uh, Cooperation and Development in Germany and Germany's uh, Governor of the African Development Bank. He's an influential parliamentarian in the Bundestag, 
and has used his influence to promote development policies rooted in the idea that German development and cooperation must help people to help themselves. And Eric Solheim, you've already met, uh, so I won't, I won't introduce your uh, enormously impressive career again. So that's the panel. Um, thank you all very much for, uh, for being here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off with um, uh, asking you some questions, uh, and then we'll turn it over to the floor. So um, let me start, actually, at, with... Let me, let me go in the same order. Um, uh, Stephanie, you obviously believe in... Actually, no, let me not do that. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw your face. Um, <laughs> now, Co. Um, oh. <laughs> okay. let, me, let me start with you, because I, when I was reading the, the Development Corporation report again last night, and I, I do recommend it, uh, uh, perhaps not all weekends, but you should spend some of your weekends <laughs> reading it. it. It calls for the world to be politically courageous and innovative in financing global public goods. Now, those of you who've watched the British TV series Yes Minister will know that courageous is a euphemism <laughs> for political suicide. <laughs> so do you think there's any prospect that OECD countries will live up to this need to spend money on global public goods, mm -hmm. including the environment, but there are many others as well? Mm -hmm. um, and if so, what needs to happen mm -hmm. uh, for that to happen? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I think for the last two decades, I think there is a very good progress in terms of maybe two things. The first, uh, there is an increasing recognition and emphasis on the country ownership, which actually made the aid very, very effective in terms of delivery. The second good thing which happened for the last two decades is an, uh, I think the increasing recognition of the importance of, actually, of development and uh, uh, environment coming together. So there is no um, separation between these two. And uh, that's actually the agree that the name, say, 20 years ago at the Rio Summit, and uh, uh, in terms of Climate Change Convention, Biodiversity Convention, Land Degradation Convention. So there is an, uh, a recognition from world top leaders that uh, these global public goods need to be financed. And actually, that's why the GEF, which I'm now leading, was born. So the, that is the positive side. However, let's face the fact, are we or are these mechanisms have been successful in providing global public goods to the scale which actually address the biggest challenge of the humanity is now facing? So look at this global warming. Look at the loss of biodiversity, the forest and land and the ocean which has been so ill. So in terms of the just the fact, but then I have to say we are not necessarily successful in delivering global public goods. And I think the issue is why that now we are actually this aid mechanism has been successful in strengthening the country ownership and a lot of progress has been made in the development. Still, we really don't have a good uh, mechanism to provide the global public goods. So that has been the challenge I think that we have been facing. Um, I think that then, uh, uh, the challenge, uh, uh, just going back to this report, which is very timely and wonderful, and actually it pointed out a very good thing about this uh, separation, and uh, no separation between development and environment, and also the importance of aligning this uh, national goal uh, with the global goal. But the real challenge, I think, that the report also should address, and we all have to address, is how to deliver, that then how to implement of those important propositions. So that then, then that then while I think that the uh, the country ownership is an important to align the national objective, um, um, and to to strengthen the national objective, the challenge is how to align the national goal with global public goods, and where that the politicians and world leaders are a bit of short in actually that the making these two connections and not too, too tight. And look at the World Bank and look at the Jeff, that our aid delivery system is still very much organized by country, by country. And if you go to the each of the countries and ask the political leaders, to them the top priority is to make sure that their national good objective is delivered, not necessarily global public uh, objective is delivered. So that is actually that, uh, 
uh, uh, that, that challenge. And then later, I'd like to share with you how that then also that then from based on that then experience, what are the alternative mechanism to deliver the global public? Excellent. I will hold that thought and I will ask you <laughs> in, in a second. But State Secretary, there was a, a, a political challenge there. Um, we heard ab about three sources of finance, domestic revenues, uh, private investment, and um, ODA. Um, and um, we've just been hearing that it's proven difficult to, to have enough funding for global public goods. From Germany's perspective, are you optimistic that there will be both the amounts of money and the mechanisms uh, needed to meet these challenges? Uh, are we doing enough, not only in terms of providing ODA, but also in terms of improving the way we work with the private sector and improving the way we finance global public goods? How do you, how do you see this moving forward? Well, we will always try to increase our budget. But of course, it's, it's a question of gaining awareness mm -hmm. for the issue of global public goods. Because in the perspective of other ministries, of competing ministries when it comes to budget, uh, the internal domestic issues are much closer to many parliamentarians. So we have to, uh, to gain awareness for the need for financing development cooperation. And, um, we try to constantly increase our budget. And um, of course, we, I, I fully agree with this perspective to have a strong focus on domestic resources. And uh, for example, with a view on um, regional integration in many areas, in South America, in uh, Africa, across the continent, there will be a growing need for many countries to to gain new income by, by taxation. Because the consequence of regional integration often is that uh, abolition of uh, tariff and non-tariff barriers to trade um, need, uh, leads to need for, for better taxation, public financial management. So there is um, um, a perspective, I think, for um, increasing also domestic resources and um, just to give you a, a small insight, uh, a few weeks ago, I, I learned that um, a software company from Germany is planning to invest 500 million euros in five African countries for uh, software telecommunication for public finance management uh, in order to uh, improve the situation to mobilize domestic resources. Um, of course, uh, and, and to, to do this, um, um, we should really concentrate our ODA means on the most uh, needed, on the neediest uh, people, and also to uh, use our ODA and increasing ODA to finance uh, global public goods, because uh, these needs uh, exceed by far the capabilities of uh, single countries. And uh, our specific interest from German side would be to use the entire variety of funding instruments from concessional to non-concessional funding. Mm -hmm. um, if we concentrate our official development aid <coughs> to uh, the, the neediest, uh, we should also give a chance to emerging countries to mobilize more and more domestic and private sector uh, resources. And this would require a strategy uh, how to uh, reduce or even phase out ODA to emerging, uh, with respect to, to emerging countries, mm -hmm. but to replace it uh, step by step through uh, more and more market-oriented funding and non-concessional loans. So in order to be relevant in those countries, <coughs> you will have to, to do a lot, maybe even more when it comes to amounts than in uh, least developed countries. But this would not be uh, possible by ODA alone. So it should be complemented by additional fundings from the private sector as well as uh, the domestic resources. Fantastic. Thank you. Stephanie, I imagine you would agree with quite a bit of that. You obviously believe in the importance of 
jobs and growth and, and the private sector in, in reducing poverty. Um, we've seen these very large increases in foreign direct investment, in portfolio flows, remittances, but rather little uh, increase, in fact, a rather stagnation in what the se State Secretary was just talking about, which is official non-concessional flows. Is it your sense that your job is done, that, that you know, now you've, you've levered in all these private sector flows, we no longer need official flows? What do you see as, what do you think will happen to these either non-concessional or only very partly concessional uh, official flows? And what, where do you think that should go? And what's their role in the system in the future? So, um, thank you. Uh, I think we need both. We need uh, a lot of both. Um, and let me just say that, uh, so before I took my new position as director of Western Europe a week ago, I was working on climate change at IFC uh, for six uh, years before that. And so I'll answer your question, I think quite a few of us from the climate perspective, from the global public good of uh, climate. Um, so I found out, I, I think a lot of us have seen this figure that um, for climate, the Climate Policy Initiative uh, said that last year there were 360 billion. There, so there's been an increase in flows from all sources for uh, low carbon development. So that's about a billion dollars a day, and it sounds good, but it's very, uh, you know, it does not cover what's needed. I think the most conservative estimates are 700 um, uh, billion to a trillion that's needed every year. So I think the key really to unlock more, and a lot more is needed. Um, is to find that right combination, and there isn't one, I think there are many ways of doing this, but the right combination of um, uh, let the market work where it's working, and it is in a number of sectors, we're seeing that in renewable energy in particular in many of our markets, um, and strategically come in where we need to on concessional finance. Um, so, I mean, the, the two examples I would give there in terms of leveraging uh, are uh, blended finance and then what we're trying to do with institutional investors. So blended finance actually, uh, the Jeff was uh, our earliest partner in, uh, in working on donor-funded um, climate and uh, I think it's really taken off since then. The, um, the kinds of things that we've been able to do with a small amount of concessional finance has really opened up markets. Um, last year we did, um, about a year and a half ago, concentrated solar in South Africa, which was the first concentrated solar project we had ever done, and the first that South Africa had done, and, and really in support of diversifying away from coal-fired uh, power in South Africa. Um, we needed a, a substantial amount of blended finance to make that uh, a, to actually CSP projects doable. Um, and my favorite example is actually on the green building side. Uh, so uh, there are quite a few segments on the energy efficiency side that to any of us have, who have looked at the figures are no-brainers in terms of investment, but they don't happen for lots of reasons. In the case of green buildings, um, the barriers are misinformation or lack of information. Um, developers don't want to put in the extra cost to design uh, the green element. Um, it's just a, can be very little extra cost, but they don't want to put that in if they don't feel the home uh, buyers are going to appreciate that and pay additional amounts. Home buyers have a lack of understanding very often about what the potential is, uh, the savings potential, and banks are not willing to finance the additional costs. So what we've been doing with, a, again, a little bit of concessional finance is opening up those markets. Um, and in fact, we just closed in July uh, with uh, Jeff Money, a project, again, in, so I'm not going to just give South Africa examples, but again in South Africa for, um, for housing, low-income housing. Uh, which was made possible because of this kind, kind of finance. And the, the second big area, and for me it's sort of the holy grail, and I think a lot of us talk about it this way, is the institutional investor. And I saw on here you talked about, I think I wrote down, 83 trillion in OECD countries among institutional investors. And tapping into just a little bit of that could make a huge difference in this area. Uh, so um, one of the things we did a couple of years ago was to create, uh, through IFC's, um, um, asset management company, a fund of funds, in other words, a fund that would invest in clean tech funds that would in turn invest in um, low carbon uh, projects. We just closed that uh, last year, a few months ago, 400 and some um, million. And uh, again, we needed some concessional finance to get the first round of fundraising to make that possible, and the Canadians uh, supported that. 
Um, and, uh, and the last piece on institutional investors, which is, I think, very timely right now, is the, the emergence of green bonds. And the World Bank, IFC, and uh, many of us have been involved uh, in the green bond space. That is taking off now. Um, I think we're at 27 billion so far this year. We're seeing corporates coming into this space, too. So that's, you know, getting um, these kind of investors comfortable with a new class of um, investment is critical. And I think if we can unlock that, a lot more will flow. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Bruno Wen, uh, you heard the 83 trillion figure. Um, Eric has told us the world has plenty of money. Um, I think you're also very careful to say that it isn't money that's the only answer to development. Um, uh, but when you look at the world and the world in which DEG invests, um, is it your sense, I mean, there's clearly huge untapped potential there, massive investment opportunities. Is the problem absence of finance? Or from where you're sitting, is, are there other problems that need to be uh, addressed before those investment opportunities are there? What, what for you would unlock the investment potential of the universe in which your organization is investing? I think Eric, uh, Eric pointed it out and very clearly policy reforms are a necessary enabling environment. For example, he mentioned uh, Africa and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the lack of, uh, of investment in, in the power sector. From a private uh, sector perspective, it's clear. We, uh, out of the 54 countries in Africa, only five or six have a, uh, a regulatory framework in place which is suitable for the private sector. So when we when we are looking then how to implement the United Nations Initiative for Sustainable Energy for All, then we need some more smart ODA. What I mean by that, for example, uh, in, in in almost all African countries. Uh, it's difficult uh, to, to finance a private uh, power plant which uh, should feed the power into the system if you have to agree on a power purchase agreement with a power utility which is almost bankrupt. So using ODA to guarantee power purchase agreement which would unlock huge amount of funding. Mm. For example, within the German Development Corporation, we had been very successful. Our colleagues from GIZ, which is the technical assistance agency, they have helped uh, to reform the energy sector in Senegal. So they have to introduce for the first time a regulatory framework so that the private sector is able, uh, uh, <clears throat> has the right to produce energy and to feed the energy at a, at a prescribed price into the system. This has unlocked a huge amount also of domestic financing. So this is why it underlines very critically uh, the need for policy reforms and I think ODA uh, can be extremely helpful in, uh, in, in unlocking that. And uh, as, as Stephanie pointed out, there's huge money around looking for business opportunities in developing countries. We are seeing that there are now pension funds, they are looking urgently mm. for responsible investments in developing countries. So unlocking this potential uh, and, um, and, and, uh, and, and we as DEG and also uh, some of our colleagues from European Development Finance Institutes, we have already created funds in which we mobilize funds from pension funds. So the, uh, we, for example, at DG this year, we have closed the first fund for, for, for Protestant uh, 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 pension funds. They are looking for uh, uh, projects in renewable energies, but uh, they have not uh, the right mechanisms and they have not the capacity to, to identify suitable projects, to structure projects, to, to mitigate risk. And this is, I think, also one area which we can use uh, much more smart ODA, simply reducing risk. The world is full of risk. Sometimes risks are perceived to be high and the actual risks are extremely lower. That's a, uh, that's a problem of perception. But un there's, there's a huge potential which, uh, which could be used uh, if, we, if, we, if we use ODA in a, in a, let me say, different way and helping governments to enabling the environment, creating the enabling environment for the private sector. And by private sector, that's very important. I not only focus then on foreign investors, but on local investors. There's a lot of money around. Thank you, Eric. I'm going to ask you a quick question, then I'm going to turn it over. Um, what we've heard from the panel is a lot of interest in using ODA um, to support smart <coughs> investment 
um, to, to use more of it for global public goods, to, 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 um, to enable the private sector to come and invest. Do you think there's a tension between that and what you were saying about the need for ODA to be focused on the poorest people in the world, the poorest countries? You were saying um, that uh, half of ODA should be going uh, to, to the least developed countries. Is, I mean, I, I don't want to em embarrass our German friends, but, but German aid to Africa fell in 2013 um, by, I think, 17 percent. And I, I see this trend in my own country in the UK, where there's much more interest in using aid to support private investment and private activities. What does that mean for the very poorest people? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May I please have your attention? We are performing a test on the fire alarm system. I apologize. This is only a test. Please disregard any alarms you may hear. So planning is great. Excellent. Excellent. Eric's got this button for when he gets a difficult question. <laughs> Oh is, is there is there a trade off here? I mean, you're, I know you're going to say we should do both, but but um, <laughs> yes. but to what extent do you see the the world the pendulum shifting towards support for the private sector, and at what cost to the world's poorest? Uh, um, very clearly, th there is a danger here because I mean, uh, it's a no brainer to to understand that it, if you are a German company, it's much easier to invest in Brazil or Turkey or. Mexico or China uh, the, uh, than there is to invest in South Sudan, Central African Republic, Somalia uh, or Mali, and just to mention them I in some of the most difficult, difficult places. I mean, that, that's very obvious. Uh, that's also why we, we, you would probably not need any uh, huge amount of development assistance to get private sector investment in the, in the upper middle income countries. In those nations, you may need it to direct this investment into the right areas like, uh, like climate change, that you, you would not need it to get the Siemens to invest in, in, in China, just I meant to be very, very specific. While if you can use clim uh, public budget all day as a risk elevation factor, you may make it much more possible for private companies to invest in the more difficult places. But also I have to say that we, we, we need to have much better for us for a specific debate with private sector. Because private sector companies don't take an interest in the general global principles which are so dear to all of us here. They take an interest in their specific area. I mean, if you are Walmart, you will be interested in retailing and, uh, uh, and food. If you are Shell, you are interested... Your time's up. <laughs> Okay. This is to demonstrate the risk aversity in the modern society. I mean, thir 30 years back, we didn't have anything of this. So and people died in fire. Yeah, right? That's, right, that's right. Exactly right. I mean, we, we have reduced the, the number of, of people dying, for instance, in traffic accident, mm -hmm. uh, road accident, is now the biggest uh, uh, source of death uh, 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 among Your people attention. between 15 and 30. Germany, I think, has reduced road accidents with about 80% since, since 1970, while the traffic is doubled. So it's fantastic progress. But it also made us risk averse yeah. in a way people were not uh, 30 or 40 years back. So that's, that's the trade off. Leave that, that's another discussion. Uh, what, 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 what we need to me is a much more specific and concrete debate with the private sector. And I give an example. Many African nations have, for instance, provided huge tax incentives uh, to get uh, investment, which many private sector companies say are not necessary. 
Uh, they're not even needed. They just undermine the tax basis of Ghana. We have made some OECD calculations of how much money Ghana has lost because of this kind of tax uh, liberty for companies. That's not what they need. Nearly every time I speak to someone from a private sector company, they come to what, what you say. Legislation, making certain that there will be not, not a change of government and then some president coming in and changing everything. I mean, it's, it's much more about the politics, uh, the institutions, the legislation, than it is about these kind of incentives. Mm -hmm. So why don't we provide for much better conversations between top leaders of developing nations with development partners and private sector companies to at least make certain that a government know what are the important issues to address if you want private investment. If you can give one example, some, one of the most promising developments in Africa now are Chinese companies coming in investing in manufacturing. There's hardly any manufacturing in Africa. Uh, I spoke to some of them, they said, we, we, we wanted to start in Ethiopia. Then I asked, why Ethiopia? It's landlocked, one of the poorest nations in Africa. Well, they said, because the top leadership have bought in. The top leadership are ready to cut through the bureaucracy. If you have difficulties in getting our clothes through to Djibouti, where there is the harbor, and into the uh, world market, we know that the prime minister will react and will make certain this happens. That's the difference. That's, what, that's the one and the sole reason why they wanted to invest in Ethiopia and not any other African nation. So these issues, I think, are absolutely yeah. crucial. Excellent. Quick point from Bruno, and then I'm going to turn it over. I would like also to, to add, uh, there is another area mm -hmm. which uh, I think uh, support is needed, uh, because uh, there's a, a lot of debate on uh, PPPs. And the perspective of uh, governments, uh, especially in the context of Africa, is always uh, to get the private sector involved uh, so that the private sector is providing the necessary financing. But uh, at the same time, the, uh, the private sector should take as much as possible the risk. And, uh, and at the same time, they cut down the rate of return. This will not function. But the crucial issue I would like to mention here is that we also help the governments to deal with the private sector. Because the private sector, when it comes to PPPs, we're always working then on New York law. And we are confronted then with government lawyers. They really don't know what commercial law is all about. And they have no clue what uh, New York law is in project financing. Mm -hmm. The one issue. The second issue is we are coming down, the, or the project sponsor, he's coming down with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with young people, young economists, and they are running very complicated financial models on, on their laptops. And there's nobody on the government side who really understand what, what, what is going on. So right from the beginning, we fail then because they, the governments will agree on contracts which are not fair and transparent. And this is then a, a, a real problem. And I fully understand that then the next government is saying, these are extremely unfair contracts. Then the government is trying to, 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 to change the contracts, and this is then a breach of contract, and, and then nobody uh, is willing from the private sector to go there. This is, this is why it's all also in the interest of development finance institutes, also in the interest of the, of the private sector to, get, uh, to make governments fit uh, to work with the private sector. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, those of you who are watching online, if you want to make a point or ask a question, use the hashtag DCR2014, and I'll see it on my iPad. Those of you in the room, please keep your questions to 140 characters. <laughs> as if you were. Um, <laughs> um, one here. Uh, my name is Albina yeah. Mellon. I work for IFC. Uh, I'm a Chinese national. Mm -hmm. I have a question, maybe mostly to Mr. Ven and Eric. And it's sort of a political question. Before I joined IFC, I worked for two European bilaterals. Mm -hmm. And the, the big difficulties that I see are political and internal. People who work mm -hmm. on fragile states, for, for instance, completely refuse to accept to work with people who work on private sector and on investment. And if we in the bilaterals can start working together more and get a different signal from our ministers, then things could look very different. I don't know how it's in, it's in Germany. I don't have a clue. Germ Germany is not one of the two bilaterals I have worked for. But what can be done at the global level? You know, o can the OECD through the peer reviews push something? Can something be done to be more coherent internally of how we promote this private sector investment? Thank you. And um, I was going to, th this one here. Yeah. Thank you. I'm uh, Jim Michael. I uh, am an independent consultant in development cooperation. 
Uh, I used to uh, have the pleasure of uh, launching DACs when I uh, was chair of the DAC, and I want to congratulate Eric uh, on being able to convey the importance of the policies that underlie development and development cooperation and getting, as, as Nancy said, beyond the statistics <laughs> to the underlying factors that make a difference in the quality of people's lives. My question is uh, about the importance of institutions and implementing capabilities within the developing countries. Uh, there's been an emphasis, I think, in the discussion on the policies and the adequacy of policies and, and uh, in enabling environment. Uh, but I wonder if you are seeing in the developing countries a greater emphasis on building that institutional implementation capability mm -hmm. yeah. that needs to go with the improved policies. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And one here as well. Good morning. Todd Kushner with the State Department. Uh, the United Nations is convening the third conference on financing for development in Addis in July. And I wanted to ask what the panelists think is the most important thing that they would recommend be the result of that conference? Excellent set of questions. Now, who wants to? Some of those were for you, Eric, but mm. let me see yes, if so other. So yeah. okay. Okay. No, let, uh, Eric can come at the end. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just want to pick up the mm. last question. Then that, that would be the, uh, the most uh, the important outcome of this and uh, uh, financing of the. SDG, that the 2015 framework. I think that the, one, that the people are generally focusing on the government-to-government -government deal or international intergovernmental framework. But I just like to also stress one of the points which I'm trying to make. It's in who is the, what is the ideal gov governance mechanism of providing GPG, global public goods, which is suffering from this uh, uh, free rider problem. So the, why this uh, <coughs> intergovernmental deal is so important there is that then also another very important symptom of phenomena which I have observed for the last maybe two years since the Rio Plus 20. It is more like an, a joint multi-stakeholder platform approach among private sector that than the cities, not necessarily national government, but subnational government and the, and the CSOs, the research institute, even the researchers and local communities. Today we talk a little bit about forest, one of the major uh, forces of that uh, deforestation is actually that the global commodities, say palm oil, the soy, and the cattle. And there is a very interesting initiative ongoing, like on how to link up, say, the, the plantation in Indonesia, that the um, processing company like Wilma in Singapore, and then that the uh, brand company like Nestle or the Unilever, then the consumer market in India and China. So how to bring those different stakeholders together under the one united uh, platform. We call it the joint stakeholder multi-platform approach. It has been actually happening in various and uh, the commodities and the ocean, that the fish issue, and actually the building code or several energy efficiency that house appliances. So this kind of joint multi-stakeholder platform approach, I think is also very important governance mechanism to provide the global public goods. That's something we would like to 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 promote. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, do you want to start? Oh. 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 Say secretary, do you want to uh, well while we wire up? Do you want to say something about this question about yeah. internal in incentives? Uh, and and well, about just a, few, just a few remarks to uh, the post twenty fifteen agenda. I mean since this um, sustainable development goals um, shall be a universal agenda, a global partnership, including private sector, including non-governmental organizations, I think this approach should also apply to funding. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a question of, of perception, of perspective, uh, that um, this agenda addresses not only to development countries, but also to industrialized countries, to both the public and the private sector. Okay. So this should have consequences uh, in funding as well. Um, and in, in, in 
this context, we, we, we should try to, to have a well, comprehensive, inclusive, uh, inclusive approach also in funding. When it comes to um, this um, different worlds that you described between traditional development aid and private sector, I think this is not specific for development policy. I make the same experiences in domestic uh, politics as well. These are different worlds, but the question is how to to, to interconnect uh, these worlds and how to communicate. And in this context, I sometimes uh, got the impression that um, we, we make um, more experience in international affairs mm -hmm. than in domestic affairs. But um, of course, there are different approaches and uh, targets of companies and non-governmental organizations. And we should therefore seek for uh, common targets mm -hmm. and an approach could possibly be the uh, to be to act people oriented uh, so companies should think uh, how to communicate of course they uh, need to be profitable but they should also be interested in <coughs> creating jobs in generating <coughs> welfare in the surrounding uh, in which they are investing so not importing uh, uh, labor force and exporting uh, uh, the, the, the value mm -hmm. generated, but to be oriented to the society where the investment is placed. And uh, this people orientation um, uh, with respect to creating jobs, I think um, it could be a common basis for communication uh, also with uh, non-governmental organizations and in order to reach this, we should be we should think of how we can uh, include uh, uh, the people um, addressed and how to to communicate, um, uh, participate in a participatory approach. Let me just uh, add a an, an, uh, final remark to uh, contracts and advising how to uh, to negotiate contracts. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the G seven set up this Connex initiative. Which, is, which should be an offer to developing countries to use this experience. And I'm not sure whether uh, this offer is well understood and, and perceived mm -hmm. uh, in, the, um, in, in a sufficient way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I give you a small example. Um, it many, needs to be quite small uh, because uh, we uh, time. Many African countries. Uh, have uh, intensive contracts with uh, uh, companies or, or with for, for foreign direct investments, for example, from China. And I'd like to, to tell them uh, what the contracts are like that mm -hmm. German and European companies have to make uh, when it comes to foreign direct investments in China. And mm -hmm. just to, to uh, create transparency in what's going on mm -hmm. in, in contract making, I think this uh, Connex initiative would be a, a crucial point to, to make a yeah. difference. Yeah. Great, thank you. I, I know we haven't completely, um, I, I want to give everybody a chance to have a final word, but we are running out of time. So I'm gonna take some rapid fire tweet-like questions. My boss has her hand up, so she gets the microphone. <laughs> Nancy. Um. Um, so, <coughs> okay. I, I want to go back to Owen's question to you uh, Eric, about the tension, I think, and give us a sense in the report of how this has worked out. There are at least three ways that have come up today to use concessional money, ODA. One is global public goods, mm -hmm. where um, Nakao has pointed out the problems of country focus, including, by the way, in all the multilateral banks. The second is, hasn't come up very much, that's elimination of extreme poverty. That's, we hear about that in Washington all the time. That's Obama's goal, that's Jim Kim's goal. And people think of that as direct, including cash transfers to the poor. You know, deal now with services to the poor, including in health. And the third is using some ODA to leverage in, crowd in, private money. Can you give us a feel maybe with a concrete example. It, what proportion, if you had your druthers, 
Eric, would you use for each of those from the current ODA pot? Two interesting questions. Even shorter questions. Sorry. That's quite all right. You're my boss. <laughs> <laughs> just to, uh, Richard Newfarmer with the International Growth Center. Uh, just in the spirit of uh, following up on crowding in the private sector, you mentioned the importance of uh, apportioning risk to get private investment into infrastructure, and particularly the idea of uh, guaranteeing offtake arrangements, take or pay contracts from uh, weak utilities. I'd be interested to know if uh, the IFC and other donors are really moving in this direction as opposed to actually financing the IPPs. Uh, or are they also moving in the direction of uh, uh, ensuring forex risks, which is another uh, impediment? And thirdly, uh, the issue of uh, project preparation, which seems to be a major obstacle in creating a flow of bankable projects yeah. that uh, could unlock private investment in right. infrastructure. Someone got a really burning yeah. question. There's a woman at the uh, back. Hey, not, just a, not just any old woman. Um, Lisbeth Steer with the uh, Brookings Institution. I very much agree with the idea to get 50% of ODA to low-income countries, but how do we make it happen? Uh, at the moment in education, only 35% of ODA goes to low-income countries. We've been asked by the UN Special Envoy to come up with a solution. What would it be? Perfect. I'm, I'm going to turn it in a sec to the, pa to the panel and come this way so that Eric has the last word. I, Jim, I, I don't think we've answered your question. Can you just quickly say it again so that the pan somebody... Well, my, my question was, how do you see the ODA going to be used in the future for working in a collaborative way with local leadership towards strengthening institutional capability and capacity to implement improved policy? Perfect. OK, excellent. So um, starting, you don't feel you have to answer all those questions, or, or, or say something else that you want to say, uh, but answer the one that you want. Stephanie. OK, very quickly, I'll just take um, the question from the gentleman from the international uh, Growth sector, mm -hmm. is that right? Yeah. Center. Center. Uh, so yes, we need uh, we need to do both. Uh, uh, we need to be financing the IPPs uh, directly, and I think uh, we are doing that. That's a very um, active part of our business. It's uh, absolutely we need to work through all the risks, including forex risks, and more and more provide local currency where it's appropriate. That's a very big thrust for many of us. And and the last point, and maybe that's my last point, is on project preparation. Um, so when I was in my last job on climate, I lost much more sleep about the deal flow that we could finance than about the flows that we uh, needed to get from the point I was making earlier, institutional investors and others. So I think this is really key and uh, too short a uh, time to try to explain what I think is needed, but it's going to involve and it has to involve uh, working with um, legislation and, and this is part of what the World Bank is trying to do now in its reorganization where we are working across the whole spectrum trying to bring the best to bear on uh, thorny issues that need to be resolved uh, along these lines. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Now, okay. Quickly, um, to me, uh, I think we have a lot of good examples, the shiny example of how that the small and the public money actually leverage the private sector by either taking risk or sharing risk, or actually that helping the institutional capacities or to make the policy right. My problem is actually the scale, how to achieve the scale out of those nicely done, but a bit of scattered <laughs> good, good projects. That's why that I think the aggregation is important. And then this uh, now that the joint platform approach is important to address the scale, because it's really good time to, to collect those good examples uh, to, to, to the scale. Going back to your question about uh, this, how to bring this uh, demands of that then I say that then in the users to that and link up to the international institutional capital market. Actually, we are now working with the World Bank to get that the mayor's demand to the aggregate mayor's demand to switch the lighting to LED to mm -hmm. and and it's more like an approach like the preparation that then we are helping to get an institutional capital market. I think that an economics is right that the institution like us to help prepare that the project preparation. Mm -hmm. Bruno. 
<laughs> Once again, on the, on the offtake, uh, um, we as the European Development Finance Institute, we are negotiating with the European Commission to set up a fund in order to, uh, to, to issue some guarantees, and uh, I'm very hopeful that they will do it. Very recently, they have uh, given us 50 million for project preparation, because also answering the qu one of the questions of, uh, of Nancy, I think for there's not much funds needed for the private sector. We are not asking for subsidies. So, but, uh, but what we are asking is that, uh, that ODA will be used to, to, to help governments to, to, to create an enabling environment. With regard to the fragile states, I would love to finance investments in, in fragile states, but unfortunately, there is no private investor uh, trying to go there because fragile states are characterized by a lack of good governance, uh, legal system, et cetera, et cetera. So creating this kind mm -hmm. of systems would help to attract them private investors, uh, uh, also uh, locally. The final word uh, to institutions. Institution matters. So uh, from, a, from, a, from a DFI perspective, and I think also Stephanie will, will, will fully agree as an IFI, uh, we are confronted with a situation that most governments have signed international agreements. But, but they have not done well in, uh, in, in securing that the international agreements will be uh, uh, respected. So this is why we have to invest a huge amount of money in order to take care that uh, in due diligence, everything is in line with accepted international environmental standards, human rights standards, social standards, and we have to set up a very complicated and, 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 uh, uh, and, and costly system <coughs> To, to, to secure that projects we are financing are also during implementation respecting these kind of, um, uh, 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 of criteria. So to some extent, we are substituting failures of governments. So helping governments to creating this kind of institutions would be extremely helpful and would also once again reduce the risk of, uh, of DFIs, IFIs and the private sector. Yeah, with respect to the proportions we spend for Africa, our strategy really is <coughs> to spend more than 50% uh, of our bilateral means to Africa. Um, but we failed uh, last year, as you mentioned. Uh, this was not our strategy. Um, it, it, it was due to the lack of, of implementation cap capabilities. Um, um, we try to spend 1.4 billion euros in Africa and we have a, a, a large program with uh, Egypt uh, that cannot be implemented uh, mm. uh, as we uh, would like and uh, this alone has uh, more than 350, 353 million euros. So um, um, our difficulty to implement this single program correctly uh, leads to this decrease, which is not intended. Uh, it is an unintended effect mm. and not our strategy. But we uh, try to, to reach uh, this 50%. So uh, the simple answer to your question is, it's um, uh, just a question of uh, priorities. And, but the more difficult answer is, it depends on um, institutional implementation capabilities, as you mentioned before. Um, just let me say uh, a word to um, uh, this uh, uh, proportion of for, uh, funding uh, global, global public, public goods and, and uh, yeah. uh, least developed countries fighting <laughs> poverty. Um, I agree to concentrate our official development aid to uh, public goods and uh, fighting poverty, but not to restrict it exclusively to it. Uh, we should also think of uh, how to deal with emerging countries. And as I said, the more emerging countries succeed in emerging, the easier they can access to uh, markets, financial markets. Mm -hmm. But we should be invested there. Uh, in, and this is not only a question of money, it's also a question of confidence building because we need also to encourage emerging countries to do more. <coughs> and to take their responsibility when it comes to the post-2015 agenda. Excellent. Eric, they're commenting on Twitter about your brilliance in bringing in risk aversion when we had the fire drill. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so time's up. Um, you, the, last <laughs> the last word is with you. Uh, some very brief answers to some very important questions. On global public goods, I believe it's very hard to distinguish because the actual form 
of supporting global public good are practical examples, practical programs on the ground to provide solar energy uh, in South Africa, as we heard here, or to do better irrigation in Vietnam or wind farms in Nicaragua. We are not doing anything in cyberspace, it's on the ground, so it's more or less impossible to distinguish between uh, global public goods and concrete climate programs on the ground. On institutions, my view is the following. Institutions are absolutely central. That institutions evolve over decades, sometimes over centuries. The United States of America fought its most severe war among itself, uh, killing more people than all American external war combined. Uh, and you cannot expect very weak states in Africa to all of, all of a sudden come out with institutions. In, when you do, don't have institutions or when the institutions gradually evolve, the issue is leadership. By and large institutions in China were the same under the Gang of Four than under Deng Xiaoping. But the policies were completely different. So we must gradually assist in establishing institutions, but in the meantime, a leadership can achieve enormous uh, progress. On the relationship between private and public sector, I mean, it's a surprisingly big problem. I think it's less a problem in the United States than in Europe. But in Europe, in, at least in Northern Europe, which I know best, basically when you're 25 years old, you decide where you will spend your entire life in the private sector or your entire life in the public sector. And there are surprisingly, even in small societies like the Nordic, few bridges between these. And the development community, us, Basically, sorry to see to say to say CSU in Germany, but basically has come from a center-left political history, also from a religious Christian uh, uh, history, and with limited understanding of the private sector and business, frankly. Which is uh, not the case in Germany. No, in, in Germany, uh, <laughs> Germany is an exception. Uh, <laughs> but Aye, but that's that, no, no. But that, that's also why. It, it's a, it's a b big exception. We may leave, leave that for, for, for another discussion. Uh, the, the mirror image of this is for sure people in the private sector who believe that everything in, in the public sector is bureaucracy, that you cannot have taxes, and all this. There are mirror images of everything. But we, the development community, coming from a platform where many people, also in the civil society organization, have very limited and very skeptical attitudes still to the uh, private sector, must build more bridges. And again, this is about leadership. Political leaders must defend private sector when, uh, if private sector is doing well. They cannot be, they cannot be perfect. No, Oxfam is not perfect, uh, uh, nor is a private sector company. Uh, you should define, you should, if they do their best, you should def defend them. Uh, uh, on um, uh, on um, all this, we should have the same conversation as we do have here. Uh, how to assist in getting the huge domestic resource uh, revenue uh, uh, money better, how to get the private sector better, what are the pol political reforms which are needed, but also how, how can we push our companies to do, to do more and better, how can we use money to let this happen. Uh, and we should discuss ODA, uh, but we should not focus in on symbolism and these kind of quarrels which are very easily there in New York and, uh, and in climate conversations where we kick each other in the head, uh, but with no real uh, reflection of progress uh, uh, out there. I mean, every, every single prime minister, every single president, every single finance minister I've met do believe that we need more and better private investment. Still, you can easily in New York have the understanding that when you say this, it's just an excuse not to give what is much more important, which is ODA. We must out of that uh, conversation. And then the last and the most difficult. We are embarking upon something completely new because we have now decided that we will remove absolute poverty once and for all. And that is reaching out in one way or the other to the absolute poor, to the remaining of them. Let's remind ourselves that no country in the history of the planet up to now has removed poverty with a focus on the absolute poor. The United States didn't do it, Germany, Japan, no, no, no one did that. It was a focus, I mean, as Deng Xiaoping said in China, someone must be rich first. We must get industrial production up, improve the, the, the productivity of, of agriculture, all this, and then for sure that will bring many, many people into prosperity. 
But what we now is facing is the remaining 100, maybe 150 million extreme poor in, in, in China, uh, the remaining 60 million extreme poor in Latin America, etc. That's a new challenge because we, uh, we, it cannot just be uh, improving everyone, must be targeted uh, to the to very poor in a new way. We know some of these answers, I think. Cash disbursement schemes for the very poor has been successful. Microcredit has been successful. Uh, we know some of the answers, but overall, up to now, we have fought poverty mainly with general economic growth. And we need that, we need continued growth with a much more environmentally uh, friendly focus for sure. Uh, but we also now need uh, a concrete policies to really target the extreme poor. And it will be difficult, but we need that conversation. Excellent. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to. Our next meeting, um, <laughs> our, our next session is on why forests, why now? I hope you will all stay for that. We are supposed to have started now. I think we're going to give ourselves a five minutes, I'm being told, five minute break. So to grab some coffee, go to the restrooms. But I want you to thank our fantastic panel for their contributions.
So good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just giving it a minute to see if some of the people enjoying coffee and conversation will return. So thank you to those of you who've just joined us, and thank you especially to those of you who've already shared with us what was a very interesting discussion about the uh, development this year's OECD Development uh, Assistance Committee's report on overseas development cooperation. Um, we just had a panel in which the issue of global public goods came up. A lot of the focus of the panel that just completed, as those of you who know who were here, was about leveraging, crowding in, using ODA to crowd in private sector investment, which was quite interesting to me and I think quite an important contribution that the, the report that, um, of, the, of the DAC has brought to us. We now want to move on to another important contribution of that report, which was to tackle more directly than has been the case, the uh, issue of global public goods. And we're doing it in the context of what I think is a paradigmatic uh, global public good, particularly for those of us concerned with poverty elimination, prosperity in middle income as well as low income countries, um, with building capable states, um, with development more broadly defined, and that is the issue of forests, saving the world's tropical forests. So what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce um, two of my colleagues here at the Center for Global Development. This is in effect the pre-launch of what I believe will be an extremely important book that they're preparing called Why Forests, Why Now? And following their presentation, we have an extraordinary panel once again. It includes, we're very pleased, and I thank Eric Solheim for staying for another round on one of his uh, favorite issues. I think my colleague Owen Barter will introduce him more properly when we get to the panel, but I did want to interject there that it's very important that he's here and that he's staying because he wears in his soul the hat of development and the hat of environment. And he is one of the people that took amazing leadership many years ago in really putting some resources on the table or helping put resources on the table, in particular for tropical deforestation. Uh, in a, now you're going to hear from my colleagues Francis Seymour and Jonah Bush. Francis is a senior fellow here at the center, uh, and Jonah a research fellow. Uh, Francis is also a senior advisor to the David and uh, Lucille Packard Foundation. Most important, from 2006 to 2012, she was the director general of C4. Those of you who are forest folks, will know that that's the Center for International <coughs> Forestry Research uh, based in Indonesia. It is one of the centers of the CGIAR, and some of you I see here know about the CGIAR, which has been, by the way, over 20 or 30 years, in itself an important global public good. Um, prior to C4, Francis worked at the World Resources Institute, so she is, uh, I think of her as Madam Forrest in the world, but anyway. Um, and then uh, with Francis will be Jonah Bush. Prior to joining CGD, Jonah was the climate and forest economist at Conservation International. He knows more about forests than the average economist, um, but he's also really, I think, an up and coming economist in the best sense of the word on development issues. So Francis and Jonah.
Okay, thank you, Nancy. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to tee up what I'm sure is gonna be a fantastic panel discussion and take the opportunity to thank all of the members of CGD's Tropical Forests and Climate uh, Initiative for contributing to this presentation. The framing of our initiative starts with development as the ultimate objective, argues that climate change mitigation is essential to development, that forest conservation is essential to climate change mitigation, and that payment for performance is a promising approach to achieve forest conservation. Today, we're gonna to give you a sampling of some preliminary answers to a number of questions that we're gonna to try to answer in our book. Jonah's gonna tackle the ones that are in yellow. We're gonna be skipping through rather quickly, but in these nice folders that have been distributed, we have a few of our preliminary briefs with some of the figures and, and facts. And uh, we encourage you to take a look at those, as well as the many background papers that we're posting on the CGD website at the rate of about one a week. So why climate? Because climate is essential to development. This is a scene uh, from what large parts of Central America looked like after Hurricane Mitch in 1998. Events like this will become more frequent and more severe with climate change. And a recent study published by the National Bureau of Economic Research shows that the depressing impact on national income trajectories persists for more than 20 years after an extreme event like this one. And in Honduras, six in 10 rural households remain in extreme poverty. So where do forests fit into this picture? Well, halting deforestation is essential to climate stability. Quick refresher on the science. Intact forest ecosystems capture carbon in forests and soil. When those forests are cleared or burned, all of that carbon goes up into the atmosphere. If left to grow back, the carbon can be stored again. But what's happening in the tropics now is the permanent conversion of forests into other land uses themselves with ongoing emissions trajectories. So we are changing a active flow of carbon from the atmosphere into the forests and land into an active flow of emissions from the land to the atmosphere, and in between, reducing a giant pulse of carbon into the atmosphere. How significant is this? This is, the orange slice is the net emissions from tropical forest loss in the total annual global emissions, climate emissions from different sectors. But the key word here is net. The 10% figure that you hear about, that's the, the slice from tropical deforestation, is a subtraction of the gross emissions from losing forest, which is about 20%, minus the active sequestration from the forests that are left standing. So it's an underestimate of the mitigation potential of forests, which includes the potential to shrink the gross emissions by slowing deforestation and to expand the removals by forests by saving the forests we already have and planting more trees. This is a safe and natural technology for carbon capture and storage that we already have. So why forests? Because rich countries share responsibility for emissions from deforestation. If we were having this conversation 25 years ago, we'd be talking about those poor small farmers engaging in slash and burn agriculture that are responsible for deforestation. Well, what we know now is something like two thirds of tropical deforestation is caused by the commercial scale clearing of forests and their conversion to cattle pasture, to soybean fields, to oil palm plantations, to plantations of fast growing timber for the pulp and paper industry. Why is that our problem? Well, two reasons. One is that much of those commodities are traded globally. And as you can see from the results of analysis that we commissioned, to look at what happens to the embodied carbon emissions in the commodities produced by eight producer, main producer uh, countries, you can see that a lot of those embodied emissions are flowing from the tropics to the northern latitudes. And in fact, it's estimated that um, something from those countries, about a third of the embodied emissions from deforestation in the commodities produced are consumed outside the tropics. And by the way, a lot of that clearing is illegal. But that's not all. We are also responsible for those emissions because of our policy choices. This uh, diagram, which is produced by a colleague here at CGD, 
shows how the imposition of the biofuel policy directive in the EU has led to a dramatic increase in biodiesel consumption. Part of that is an increase in what's illustrated by the orange bar, oil consumption of palm oil, and as I've already mentioned, a significant driver of deforestation. Through, so through both our consumption and our policies, we share responsibility for those emissions. But what if forests had nothing to do with climate change? Would we still care about them for development? Jonah Bush is going to tell you the answer to that question. Thanks, Francis. Well, stopping climate change is perhaps the most significant contribution that tropical forests make to people, but they make many others. Uh, tropical forests contribute to people's income, to people's food, energy, health, and safety. Let me show you how. Tropical forests start providing benefits almost as soon as the first raindrop hits a forested mountainside in the tropics and they continue until that raindrop reaches the sea. So um, forests operate like air conditioners and sprinkler systems. They recycle rain as cooler, wetter air that, that uh, goes downwind to farms so that farmers can grow more food. The forests along rivers keep sediment out of the water so that that clean water can be used for irrigation, for cooking, and for cleaning, especially in the dry season. And this leads to better health. And forests along the coast, mangrove forests, buffer against the impacts of storms and tsunamis, saving coastal lives and property. Uh, these, these services are often non-marketed. They don't show up directly in GDP, and so they are invisible to most development planners. But they have tremendous value nonetheless. Uh, let me just share with you a few statistics that economists and scientists have come up with. Um, intact forests provide pollination services and pest control services to farmers in Indonesia, so much so that cacao farms have 45% higher yields where they're near forests and the birds and the bats eat the pests. Uh, China's Three Gorges Dam saves more than $35 million every year because forests in the watershed above the dam are keeping sediment out of the reservoir and saving the turbine blades from having to be uh, replaced. But when forests are cleared, when deforestation happens, lives and health are put at risk. Uh, the 1997-1998 forest fires in Indonesia that blanketed Southeast Asia with haze that was filled with carcinogens, heavy metals, uh, and particulate matter were responsible for more than 15,000 deaths that year and more than $300 million in health damages. Uh, the landslides in Central America that Francis showed you earlier today were made much worse because the forests above those towns had been cleared. There were no trees, no roots to hold the soil in place. So when the rain hit, the soil flowed downhill onto the, the towns and the roads below. Uh, in the hotter, more volatile climate that we all know is coming, these services of flood control, water management, food production, storm protection, all become increasingly important. So forests provide adaptation as well as mitigation. But these are all public goods, national or global public goods. They're provided by forests for free to people downwind or downslope or downriver or on the other side of the planet. They're not captured by and large uh, in the land use decisions of private landholders. Uh, and so if the beneficiaries of these national or global public goods uh, would like forests to compete against pasture and plantation, there have to be mechanisms for them to pay for these global public goods. The best example of this so far is carbon payments, results-based payments from rich countries to tropical countries for reducing deforestation. Uh, some of us at Center for Global Development have run an analysis, run some numbers of how much carbon payments it would take to reduce how much deforestation and thereby reduce how many emissions to the atmosphere. Um, and let me just give you one statistic. Let's imagine for a moment you were able to mobilize $100 billion a year for climate 
as rich countries promised to do in Copenhagen five years ago. And let's imagine further that you wanted to spend half of that $100 billion a year on stopping, deforest, uh, stopping climate change emissions in the most effective way in the developing countries outside of China. How much of your spending, then, would you want to spend on tropical forests? The answer we find is more than a third, 38%. And this is by what's a conservative model. Other models, economic models, would find an even higher figure. Uh, and then remember, if half of your money is being spent on adaptation, <coughs> tropical forests provide that too. Um, but this is, you know, th th this is economic models. This is, uh, this is not the real money. Let's say how it stacks up against the real money that's actually been put on the table to date for stopping uh, tropical deforestation. That's what's in orange. Uh, the blue is the rest of the money that was pledged during the fast start finance period. Uh, the picture here is of finance for tropical forests that is too low and too slow, with the, with the one notable exception in the middle here of Norway. So as long as the big money is sitting on the sidelines, tropical deforestation continues and is actually increasing at record pace, with, again, one notable exception. That exception is Brazil. Brazil, if you remember back to the 80s and 90s, uh, was ground zero for deforestation. Between 1989 and 2004, Brazil cleared an area the size of France. Uh, and outside groups were painting Brazil as an environmental villain. Now, fast forward today, all that has changed. In the last decade, Brazil has cut Amazon deforestation by more than 80%. Uh, and they did it while increasing food production. Cattle production went up more than 20%. Soy production went up by more than 65%. And now, Brazil's reduction in deforestation makes the, them the country that has done more than any country on Earth to reduce climate change emissions. For that, they are rightly lauded as environmental heroes. How did they do it? They, they did this through a combination of policies. They designated an area the size of France as protected areas or indigenous lands. They used cutting edge satellite technology that they developed to enforce their forest laws. And they cut the link between agriculture and deforestation. They uh, discouraged agriculture at the expense of forests while promoting agriculture on already cleared land. All of this was backed by sustained high level political will. It was reinforced by civil society coalitions and, and external recognition by way of the Amazon Fund. By the way, the, the activities that Brazil has taken on accord well with another study commissioned within CGD or performed, performed by CGD researchers looking at dozens of policies for stopping deforestation across hundreds of studies and finding uh, the ones that work best are largely the ones in Brazil. So uh, the forests are critically important for climate change. Economics says that conserving forests is eminently affordable and good value. What does the politics say? Thanks, Jonah. So I was really delighted that in the session this morning, uh, Minister Solheim said, it's all about politics. And in the foreword to the OECD report uh, released today, he says, making the right political decisions is of utmost importance to development. So I feel like that validates our decision to commission a number of studies about the politics of international finance for forests and climate change at the international level in forest countries as well as in the donor countries. One of the interesting things we found is that there's a positive mutually reinforcing dynamic between the international negotiations on climate in the UNFCCC and actions taken in key forest countries here, Brazil and Indonesia highlighted. What I'll say today briefly is that on the international side, negotiations on the role of forests in climate change have been the most successful arena of negotiations. Starting in Bali in 2007, Something called Red Plus, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, came onto the official negotiating agenda, and by last December in Warsaw, the negotiations were effectively complete. 
So this is the one area where we have international political consensus on what we need to do. Key point, Red Plus is performance-based finance from rich countries to forest countries for reducing emissions from deforestation. In forest-rich countries, it's of course a, a very challenging political environment with many forces of business as usual represented by those uh, agribusiness drivers. And certainly recent elections in Brazil and Indonesia mean that this chapter uh, is not yet to be written. But there are some interesting things that have happened politically in the forest countries. One, some in interesting constituencies have mobilized behind RED. In Indonesia, indigenous rights groups have utilized the new political space to advance their agenda for claiming their rights to forest land. And anti-corruption agendas as well have been served by the new space created by RED. Just last week, the governor of Riau province was arrested under suspicion of uh, corruption in the context of a land conversion transaction. In addition, the international progress on uh, coming to agreement on this has both been informed by and informed the national commitments from these countries. In 2009, following on the Bali conference, the president of Indonesia came forward with the first voluntary developing country commitment to emissions reduction, mostly based on forest emissions. And not least, the links to the availability of performance-based finance have been key. And we've seen in case studies of Brazil and Indonesia how the billion dollars that the government of Norway put on the table in each of these two countries, Indonesia and Brazil, helped consolidate uh, political will that was already there and empower constituencies for reform. Now, many of you know that this institution, CGD, and its leader in particular, Nancy Birdsall, has been associated with a concept called cash on delivery aid, the idea that a better model of development assistance might be paying for the actual desired outcomes rather than getting involved in designing the imp and financing the inputs. And one of the hypothesized benefits of this approach is that it fundamentally changes the relationship between donor and recipient from a charitable or a conditionality uh, driven enterprise to one that's more of a partnership of equals. If a picture is worth a thousand words, perhaps these two pictures are worth two thousand. The first is the image of Michelle Kamdasu of the IMF standing over President Suharto when he signed the IMF letter of intent in the Asian financial crisis in 1998. The second image are the two heads of state, gov government of Norway, government of Indonesia, signing another letter of intent, this time in the context of Red Plus in 2010 in Oslo. You might note that both of these letters of intent included uh, agreements to reduce uh, emissions from def or to, to impose a moratorium on further forest clearance. I think the latter one has a better chance of success. Oh, sorry. Yes, I don't have a pointer, but the guy in the red tie, uh, he's wearing a green tie today, but you'll hear more of him later on. So, um, in the politics in industrialized countries also uh, can line up. Clearly, industrialized countries who face high cost emission reductions at home are attracted by the potential lower cost emissions reductions by tropical deforestation. And also, the idea of results-based finance is attractive. You only pay for what you get. In addition, there is a grudging recognition that the 30 years of traditional development assistance to the forestry sector haven't been that effective. So maybe willingness to try something new. And finally, there's perhaps most importantly, support from new private sector constituencies. Some of you may recognize this gentleman in the upper left-hand corner. This is Paul Pullman, the CEO of Unilever, who was the recipient of CGD's 2014 Commitment to Development Award for his initiatives, both at his company and also in the context of something called the Consumer Goods Forum, a big industry association, to get deforestation out of the supply chains of those four big commodities that I projected earlier. Over the last two years, there has been a cascade of major corporations on the retail and manufacturing side, the trader business, as well as some primary producers to sign on to this kind of commitment. In New York, just last month at the UN Secretary General's Climate Summit, Many of these corporations signed on to the New York Declaration on Forests, which commits to a halving of deforestation by 2020 and an end by 2030. And most importantly, these corporations have now been coming out calling on governments, 
in the case of the Consumer Goods Forum in June, calling on governments to support Red Plus. And these signers of an oil palm pledge calling on producer country governments to harmonize their laws and regulations upwards to support these commitments. When we have these kind of companies whispering in the ears of government decision makers, it'll help them make better decisions. Okay, uh, but there are challenges. Um, these include the fact that budget austerity affects ODA overall. There's a risk aversion of aid institutions, both to entanglement in a complicated sector, forestry, as well as performance-based finance. And there's a difficulty of harmonizing objectives across development aid agencies focused on the poorest countries and peoples and the climate ministries who are more interested in reducing emissions wherever they can be reduced. CGD has convened a working group. This is an image from our first meeting back in April to try to see how we can overcome some of these challenges. Here's where we are. Less than $10 billion cumulatively to the forest agenda for climate. We need probably double that on an annual basis, at least, to make a dent in the problem. And the minority is performance-based. Let me close by just saying the window of opportunity is closing, both politically and in the natural world. This is a map of all of the countries who have signed up to participate in RED and who are on the road to wanting to be eligible for scaled performance-based finance. It's a wonderful quote from one of the donor country case studies we commissioned. A donor official says, in Warsaw, we closed negotiations on the Red Plus rulebook, so the rules are there now. They can be implemented like Brazil. They did it. If more countries follow that example, they will put us, the donors, in a very uncomfortable position. They will say, so we're here now. Where is that predictable, stable finance for results-based payments? Here's where we are now. Only uh, seven countries or jurisdictions have scaled up performance-based finance agreements in place. Just three weeks ago, there would have been two countries less because uh, Brazil, uh, sorry, uh, Norway and Germany announced a new program in, in Peru and Norway a new program in Liberia. So we have a gap to fill. Finally, the, natural, the opportunity in the natural world is closing. As Jonah said, tropical deforestation is actually increasing. It's not yet decreasing. And if you don't feel a sense of urgency yet, I think the next animation, which shows deforestation in progress over the last decade, will help engender that sense of urgency. This is deforestation in the province of Rial, where the governor just got arrested. Uh, the green turning to red is conversion of tropical forests, principally to oil palm or to fast-growing timber. Um, but you can see just how quickly the forest is disappearing. So I close by saying, why forests? Why now? Because reducing deforestation is urgent. It's affordable and it's feasible. Thank you. Ah, excellent. So we're moving to the panel discussion now, right? Yes. Excellent. Come on up. On, we don't have enough chairs, do we? Uh, Come, oh, do we? We're Come. Not, we're not sitting up. Are you not? Okay. So please, please come on up. Hi, everyone. My name is Owen Barder from the Center for Global Development. I'm a senior fellow here and our Europe director. And um, it's my pleasure once again to, uh, I've, I've done this already this morning for, for those of you who were here earlier, uh, to introduce a really stellar panel to discuss the issues that Francis and, uh, and Jonah have, have presented. Um, we don't have a lot of time because I know some of our uh, panelist colleagues have to be out the door at 1230 so I'm going to be very brief myself, and I'm going to ask them to be very brief, and I'm going to ask you to be very brief. Um, but let me begin with some introductions. Uh, from my f f furthest to my left, and I'm going to stumble over your surname, so please correct me if I get this wrong. Uh, Hela Chaikrahu, is, is that close? Excellent. Is the Green Climate Fund's first executive director. In her initial six months, the fund has opened its headquarters in South Korea, and is making steady progress towards uh, becoming the leading funding facility for climate change actions in developing countries. She was previously director of energy, environment, and climate change at the African Development Bank, where she took a lead role in scaling up green growth and climate resilient investments with innovative blending of public, private, and climate finance. Uh, to her right, Lawrence Tubiana, absolutely extraordinary uh, CV and collection of responsibilities, founder of the uh, of IDRI, the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations, 
in Paris, Professor and Director of the Sustainable Development Center at Sciences Po in Paris, Professor of International Affairs, this is all simultaneously, I want you to know, uh, at Columbia <laughs> University <laughs> School of International <laughs> Public Affairs, and just recently, Special Representative, appointed Special Representative for the 2015 Par Paris Climate Conference and Ambassador for Climate Change. So I guess I need to call you Ambassador now. Um, Excellency. <laughs> uh, and uh, in her spare time, she's <coughs> President of the Board of Governors of the French Development Agency. Uh, you're very welcome. It's, it's great to have you on the panel. Eric, uh, some of you have already heard from this morning, uh, but for those of you who weren't here, uh, again, an extraordinary uh, career, the, uh, currently the chair of the OECD DAC. Also, are you still also this, the UN Environment uh, Programme Special Envoy for Environment, Conflict and Disaster? Uh, he was previously, many of you will know this, simultaneously Minister for International Development and Minister for the Environment in Norway, um, in which role he emphasised conflict prevention, the role of business and taxation, sought to integrate development and environment into overall foreign policy, and as you saw in the slide earlier, played a key role in establishing the UN, UN RED program to conserve the world's rainforest. So somebody who really brings together a commitment on forests, on the environment, and on development. So that's our panel. Um, why don't you give them a round of applause just for being great. Um, so I'm going to start, um, I think I'll start with uh, Hello, if I may. Um, the presentation that Jonah and Francis have just made says that um, at least a third of climate finance should be going to protecting forests. Um, the Green Climate Fund is considering channeling money through lots of different windows. Do you think that you will be able to mobilize resources for forests? Is there likely to be a dedicated window for forests? Um, it, it, will it get funded out of the normal mitigation and adaptation windows? What's are we going to end up with the traditional approach of supporting forests through inputs, and, or are we going to be able to get some kind of results-based ideas in play? How do you see this going forward? Thank you, Owen, and it's a pleasure to be with you today and to be with such a distinguished uh, panel. Um, the, it's, it's actually quite timely that you ask this question, since um, probably a few months ago the answer wouldn't be unknown, while today uh, the board of the fund has already uh, defined that um, uh, the area of uh, sustainable management of forests and land use is one of the four key result areas within the mitigation window, and that um, the uh, areas of <coughs> ecosystems-based adaptation and of food and water security are two of the four uh, essential result areas in adaptation. So as you can see, while so far we have an adaptation window, a mitigation window, and a private sector facility only, so we don't have a red plus window, um, the uh, work on forests is going to have a prominent um, role within the fund's ability to support countries. And of course, by choosing eight result areas, four in adaptation and four mitigation, we're not saying that in all countries we have to work on all of these areas. It's more a menu from which countries will prioritize. So as you showed, there are 50 uh, countries that are primarily forest countries, and those in our dialogue with them, hopefully we'll prioritize action on forests, which will enable us to prioritize proposals that come to the fund that are focused on, on forests. Also next week in Barbados, the board uh, in their last meeting for the year will be discussing a proposal about the results management framework for ex post red plus uh, payment based system. Uh, so it's going to be an important discussion, and uh, we, the proposal that we put forward is based on the successful uh, conclusions that were reached in Warsaw uh, at the COP uh, regarding how uh, Red Plus will be tackled and the agreement that was reached there. So we hope that the guidance from the board next week will position us even better to be a part of this uh, movement that uh, Francis and John uh, so elo eloquently explained is a priority for arresting uh, deforestation of, uh, of the global rainforest. Fantastic. All right. so, Ambassador, as the convener of the Climate Change Conference in Paris, how, what, what do you think the French government will be, what kind of leadership will you be able to give on this? You've signed the New York Declaration on Forests uh, just recently. Very but, enthusiastically. 
uh, and very enthusiastically, <laughs> but you haven't yet been enthusiastic funders of performance-based yeah, exactly. financing for forests and so on. So where do you see <coughs> this going under France is and your leadership uh, in the run-up to the Paris mm, conference? And, uh, I think New York was for us a very good moment to mobilize uh, because we had, uh, of course, a lot of internal discussion and together with uh, the countries where our ODA is concentrated, in particular the um, Congo uh, River basin, ba basin, where, of course, a lot of the French ODA through uh, the French Agency of Development is concentrated. And, uh, and we had really to see our minds because, of course, we were looking very much for the complementary approach between the sustainable use and development concerns and the protection of forest and, of course, the carbon capture and storage. So I think uh, that f that's why New York Declaration was so important for us, because it was really a very, very good platform convening both companies, government, science and indigenous people organization and so really to be sure that we are really pursuing the same objective that's why now we are feeling very comfortable with this new framework and that through uh, our bilateral ODA through the influence we can have on European aid and uh, on the additional money that France would dedicate to this topic I think we are really that's why I told in the conclusion of one of the panel on forest that really for for us it is like a model for a future co cooperation and as, as least this complementary or action agenda, which I think is really a part of our vision of the global Paris Agreement or Alliance, then forests should play a very big role. And I am comforted by the fact that even <clears throat> we could go further. I saw that Unilever very recently uh, created a partnership with the FID. I think the idea just, we, we like a lot of this idea. So. We, I think we are now really totally convinced and decided, I cannot announce numbers, but we will be part of the efforts and certainly Forest, in, in our view, will be a one in the agreement because Red Plus is a, which should be a component and we have to work even more of integrating the different views around the counting, etc. And, uh, and, and it should be part of what the fourth pillar of the Paris Alliance, I don't have so much time to describe it, but yes, on the action agenda. So. So really, for us, New York was really the moment where we felt totally engaged again in forest. And uh, even if I look at, that's why we felt so comfortable in the new orientation that really is setting for the Glo Global Green Fund. That's why, in a way, we decided to put one billion for in the capitalization and that France is really now trying to mobilize everyone to the capitalization of the Green Fund, which seems for us a top priority at that stage. Fantastic news. And can I just check, you, you um, stated very clearly a commitment to uh, engaging in forestry. The results-based financing aspect of that, is that something that, that yes, the French I government Yes, I think is uh, there is then sort of sof sophistication around the way. Uh, our concern was uh, the performance-based sort of methodology is fine as long as we make sure that it incorporates development concern in the country. That's why the discussion we had with the different government, with the different ministries, and I think we, we now, for the moment, feel much more comfortable. So that's why we'll join, I think, AFD, because that then it's through how body uh, will join that movement. Excellent. Eric, you embody this combination of uh, concern for development as well as concern for protecting the forests. Now in your role in as chairing the DAC, what do you think the challenges are to getting forests to have higher visibility, higher priority, more funding, the kinds of funding that you pioneered uh, when you were Norway's development and environment minister? The short answer is what we heard uh, earlier this morning. is all about political will. It's about forming, I mean, nationally leadership and globally to form, I mean, to use a George Bush term, coalitions of the willing. Some of you may not be a huge supporter of George Bush, so that then you, you can select another term, alliances of the committed, whatever. <laughs> uh, but coalitions for action is the French uh, way of putting it up to Paris. That's brilliant. You need global coalitions of those who want to achieve something. Uh, in, in this area, uh, for long we were waiting for everyone to agree. Nothing happened in climate talks on forest because we waited for everyone. Some nations who had no trees uh, domestically and were not supposed to pay any money, 
they objected. Why did they object? Well, because they wanted to use forest as a tool to achieve other elements in the talks. And unless we could agree to what they had on the agenda for other areas, they would object to uh, moving on uh, rainforest. If you make it like that, you will achieve nothing because then the, the, everything will be uh, the, what, uh, yeah. So, but we said, no, this is not needed. Uh, if the main rainforest nations, Brazil, Indonesia, and others, with some nations are ready to provide finances for this, if we can move, we can move. I mean, President of Brazil doesn't need to ask anyone to protect the, uh, the rainforest of Brazil. I mean, he, he decides that. Uh, and we need a lot more of these coalitions, and we should move rapidly ahead on this, but we should also let it be an inspiration for other needed global coalitions. For instance, a coalition to protect the coral reefs, a coalition for the great oceans, uh, and there may be others which we can discuss. Just to give a couple of thoughts on this. Why has uh, Brazil been so, so successful? I mean, the number one factor is about individuals. Marina Silva, who just lost the election, put this up as a major concern. She came from acre deep into the, uh, to the uh, rainforest. Uh, she, th this was her soul, her, her body, her everything, and she picked it up. But she was, uh, it continued, and the Carlos Mink and Isabella Teixeira, the two, uh, uh, two other uh, develop, uh, environment ministers, and they got Lula to accept it. Uh, I have to think Lula, this is, was not the issue closest to Lula's heart, no. Closest to his heart was social development uh, and poverty elevation, not environment. But he accepted it and he let these people drive it and he protected it. And that was, the, that was why Brazil has been <coughs> so enormously successful. If you look to Indonesia, it had not been so successful, but exactly the same. Uh, Pak Kontoro, as we call him, is the driver of this in, in, in Indonesia, brilliant minister, uh, the, uh, driving this with, 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 with such a passion and, and brilliance. And unless you have this leadership, yes, you need the presidents, but you need also someone to drive it, otherwise nothing will happen. So the issue is, can you then replicate this in, in Peru, in Congo, in Papua New Guinea, everywhere else? Well, uh, th yes, you need political leadership everywhere but the global community can make political leadership more likely to happen if you provide resources uh, and you, if you provide this global conversation and if you provide a global coalition which gives you a platform to showcase what, what, what's happening. And it makes it much more easy also to argue the case of the environment in the nation if you can say that the entire global community is behind me. I may get some money even for this. And this is also high on the agenda of President Obama or President Xi Jinping. Makes it much easier to argue the case everywhere in the world. So the global coalition, the money matters. On the money, I think it has been absolutely essential uh, with these performance-based or uh, result-based schemes. Also think we should look into whether they can be used in other areas of, of development. Uh, but we can come back to that. The reason why they've been so uh, essential here is that protecting rainforest is a very big issue domestically in every big rainforest nation. It's like, I mean, it, for, to Brazil, rainforest may be like what oil is to Norway. I tell you, if anyone comes to Norway and asks, give us advice on oil policy, entire par parliament is rising up. Every minister is furious. And they will all say, no, 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 we, it's extremely dangerous if anyone is allowed to interfere in our brilliant oil policies in Norway. But, Rainforest is of enormous consequence to the biggest rainforest nation. And it's a domestic uh, sovereignty issue, so, and it cannot be resolved unless they drive it. That's the beauty of this. It's a contract. It's driven by the policy uh, of a rainforest nation. And I may add, it has also been of enormous significance to be able to support because there will be a lot of complaints some of the best and nicest civil society organizations with a big heart for development spend in the early phases of the UN Red most of the time complaining. <laughs> Everything was not perfect in Brazil. The dirty Brazilian politicians, while well protecting the rainforest, may have some pro programs for a dam here or there, which they didn't like. Uh, then it was of such an importance to be able to take the public opinion in Norway that but we are paying for the results. 
We are not paying for the intentions, for the speeches of the politician, for anything. We are paying result rates. If Brazil is reducing deforestation, we pay. If they don't, we don't pay. And as a kind of protection, I, I tell you, I mean, it would not have been, in my country at least, been able to sustain uh, these budgets, which have been huge. We could not have sustained them from criticism from parliament, from media, from civil society, if it hadn't been for their result-based schemes. So please protect the result-based schemes and uh, move ahead uh, uh, with uh, those. Wonderful. Thank you. What a great, I hope we've got that on video so we can put that online for why results-based financing is so important. I'm going to open it up to you, the audience. Um, please keep your, we've got microphones, so please wait till you get a microphone so that um, people watching online can hear the question and people in the room. Please keep your questions short. It can be for someone or for everyone, or if you want to make a, a short comment, that's fine, but no speeches, please. And... Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Arend uh, Kornar. I grew up in the International Monetary Fund. I'm currently working with the African Development Bank in the Horn of Africa. Um, my question is about this uh, global public uh, good. Uh, a lot has been said about political will. I think it's still also a matter of economic incentive. Uh, so my question is, uh, what is the case, according to this panel, for a global subsidy on CO2 absorption through trees? Uh, we talk a lot about tropical forests, but I mean, there are many more forests. The case for a global subsidy, uh, of course, takes specific forms already with the programs, REDD, basically paying for not doing something, for not emitting. But the case for a global uh, subsidy means for any CO2 absorption, you will pay something. Uh, and of course, it needs to be funded. Excellent. And the person next to you is also off the microphone. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> I'm uh, John Strand from the World Bank. Uh, I have a question mainly to uh, the two first presenters here. Uh, it deals with the issue of the relationship between payments and results, and uh, which I think is a very complicated one uh, because it depends on must depend on who are actually receiving the money and in what way the money is actually spent. So, when you talk about uh, these payments, uh, um, particularly Jonah uh, in his presentation and the relationship between payments and results, the issue here: who actually gets the payments? Uh, are they is it at the macro level to the government, or does it trickle down to the individual, say, farmer or, or agent that actually does the, 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 the choice to, to deforest or not? Because, because you know, th this is a, a very crucial issue in, in implementation here, and it didn't come through in the presentation. Excellent. I'm going to ask out of General Francis to answer that mm. in the text. Any more questions? Preferably from non-men. <laughs> Nancy. <coughs> uh, let me take the chance to ask Laurent. Wait for the microphone. A little yeah. bit more about the Congo. Um, it's some of, uh, maybe I'm too much the optimist, but I think I heard you saying that perhaps France would work hard on how to take an initiative with the Congo mm -hmm. on. Uh, reducing tropical deforestation there, or on subsidizing, keeping trees intact. And one more, Michelle. Hi, I'm Michelle De Nevers from the Center for Global Development. I just wanted to follow up with Hela um, on, I understand that forests will be incorporated in the windows for adaptation and mitigation, but I would wonder if you could tell us a bit about where the dis conversation is in terms of results-based approaches in the GCF. Okay, that seems like plenty for the panel. So please, I'm gonna again start from my far left, don't answer all the questions, answer the ones that you feel like answering, or just make some other point that you feel like making. Hello. Thank you, Owen. Um, so first, um, uh, I would like to, to say that um, following up on several of these uh, questions and also the presentation <coughs> and Laurence's intervention, we are now, as a Green Climate Fund, ready to support um, the, the Red Plus initiative and uh, the fight against deforestation. So the question will be about the political will to scale up uh, new and additional and predictable finance because um, the question was about how do we scale up finance for, for this 
and it was demonstrated that all the cumulative money for forests up to now was 10 billion, only less than four for uh, results-based payment. So um, thankfully, we are now weeks away from the initial capitalization of the fund. So France showed leadership uh, by uh, committing in New York a uh, billion dollars equivalent. And uh, as Laurence mentioned, um, the French authorities and the Germans are uh, supporting us in the outreach to ensure that uh, many more countries come forward with significant contributions. Now, in uh, deciding on that, the question about um, the willingness of countries to commit resources for these global public goods, which is being mentioned here, and including results-based approaches, uh, is important because otherwise it would continue to be the same pie which is about ODA and then competition within the same pie. But how can we increase the scale of finance? Uh, otherwise, we will not basically we're taking from one to the other and then the results will not, will not be significant. And uh, we hope that uh, over the last five years, including through the Warsaw Agreement, there is now clarity that through using a mechanism like the Green Climate Fund, we can make a difference. And so this should be new money and additional money uh, that can come to the Green Climate Fund. And to the answer to Michel about whether uh, we will be able to support results-based approaches, the answer is absolutely yes. Already in the governing instrument of the fund, uh, there was a special emphasis about the use of results-based approaches in the way of providing climate finance through the Green Climate Fund. And next week, we will be making a focus on the results uh, management framework for ex post uh, red plus uh, payment based um, uh, results based payment. So um, all those beautiful frameworks and, and constitutional document will will stay with little effect unless there is significant mobilization of uh, funding. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Laurence. Uh, <coughs> first, b before trying to respond to the questions, I wanted to build on Eric's statement on the importance of building coalition as a support of the lengthy and somehow difficult process in the mm. UN. And Red Plus was exactly that, mm. by the way. Mm. Because we, w whatever discussion we had was in the convention, uh, and, and we know how difficult they were and taken in hostage by many, uh, the idea is that uh, because this was going anyway to happen, I think that has changed totally the content of the con conversation. And, um, and to build on that, I think the Brazilian in a way, policy was very, I think, the tr tr in a way, try to respond to the international pressure, but of course, keeping this sovereignty at the heart of the yeah. policy, and then deciding and offering a national a domestic platform with which they control, but using this modern way of thinking. And that exactly, I think, of course, what we would like to see elsewhere. Uh, of course, Brazil was, has all the capacity, technically, scientifically, uh, to be able to raise this and construct their fund and have the money um, arriving there and be accountable of that. Uh, of course, the ideal for us would be to some countries in the, in the, con in the Congo Basin Forest to really try to build this domestic constituency able to really integrate development plans with forest management. Uh, so again, to ensure that. So, uh, and I think that, so that of course is, uh, that's why it should be in a way, we have to make progress under the agreement in Paris on the convention side, where we have to have really a better now view of how we will uh, count offsets, how Red Plus would be used, because we need that point too, but to pursue the action agenda on forest on the side. And uh, frankly, I think we'll, uh, and we still have to play with the different ways how much we can use the Green Fund to do that in some African countries with additionality of the French ODA budget, uh, how this would fit with a more vision on, um, but again, with the philosophy, we, of course, if we fund conservation of forest and the sustainable use of forest and how of course the, the performance base is a good one because uh, you have to make sure that uh, this is for something. Uh, but then with the combination now of the different flows and uh, but including responsive, responsible behaviors of companies that I think in the 
uh, Congo case uh, is absolutely central because we need them to be serious. We need to fight against illegal logging. So everything, this red plus and uh, performance base means something if you have really a good governance status and, and really uh, actors that are engaged. That's why we felt sort of that the platform like New York, platform on forest and declaration, and if we have the companies really being part of it, then we, it begins to give us security and safety on what we are doing. I just wanted to, um, so global subsidies, um, but again, we of course the reality, and that's why I think I like your intervention. Who will receive the money? And I think that's absolutely central, in particular in case where really uh, public finance is not secure. Many times in countries that there is a lot of uh, export of capital, um, how we make sure that the people who are in the forest receive the money for because that's their livelihoods, which we are talking about. And I think that's super important. So we have to make sure, and that now is that we are more and more an intelligent and understanding on how to do that, but that should be a very, very important criteria uh, to, to operate. That's why uh, a global mechanism, I see the interest of having Red Plus as a mechanism of implementation of the emission reduction, and that should, of course, be built on a carbon price, meaning that the global subsidy could be based on this carbon price. But we, I think we are far away from really designing a channel of funding, identification, and that really could sort of build the rationale for having a global subsidy for forest. Maybe one day we could do that. I think it's far too early. That's why I think we, it's, it's very good to really operate on very concrete cases on the ground, and that's, I think, why I think the Norway leadership was very useful, finally, to just to understand what we were doing. So pushing for the governments and the different constituencies to create what the Brazilian has done in their country. So as we have a sort of security on really people interested in this maintenance of forests and the preservation, and the people who will have to benefit from it really create a transparent framework, that is, that's the best way to combine uh, the development sort of agenda of the countries and the necessity of the preserving the livelihood. So that we need to find the institutional solutions, I think. Uh, if not, we'll do very, very minor contributions. That's at least the try what we tried to do in the Congo case, which in a way on the Congo government side, there, there is a good willingness to, to act. Problem if they are, are they able to make this, this really implementable? That's a question mark. Thank you. Some of the main lessons learned from my point of view. Number one, the fact that we took this out and established concrete uh, coalition of, uh, for action out there came back and informed the climate negotiations in a very positive way. After you had established this and it was up and running and producing results, there was no difficulty uh, resolving the climate uh, talks. I was facilitator for that in a number of the climate uh, COPs with the then Ecuadorian uh, uh, Minister of Environment, and we had very few difficulties after because the facts spoke for themselves and the opposition uh, was reduced. So uh, this kind of exchange between the uh, reality out there, which the Green Climate Fund can, will play an important role in, and talks, I think is one of the lessons. Another lesson is that the, that payment, uh, uh, the payment system is essential. Uh, in the case of Norway, the money was simply given, so to say, to the Bendes, which is the development bank of Brazil. We did not want to be involved in whether the money should be spent in Rondonia or Amazonia province, or whether it should be spent on tourism, uh, sustainable tourism projects which could create uh, employment, or on small industry programs, or, or in what the Brazilians have done enormously successfully engaging with the indigenous groups. I mean, the fact that you have a high level policy in Brasilia, that you also have indigenous people all over Amazon who are now empowered because by law, they, are, they I mean, they are, they are simply implementing the laws on the ground. That makes it much more easy. But if you come into a situation where those paying far abroad uh, should go into all these policy options, you will fail. Uh, we, we simply don't have the competence to make the decision. The Brazilians have their competence. 
but adding to that, we will be seen as responsible for all this and we will simply not be able to sustain it with all the criticisms from Greenpeace who don't like something or Parliament who doesn't like something or a media outlet who have heard that there is a problem here and there. Maybe the governor of a province is corrupt and maybe that person has um, abused some funds. All this is much, much easier to handle if it's performance-based, result-based, because you don't pay if there, isn't uh, if there are not results. So I think to keep that is absolutely essential, and we simply don't have the competence to run programs in what a complex society, Indonesia, much, much more complex than France, not to speak of small Norway. Uh, uh, it's an extremely complex society, and only the Indonesians can be able to handle the problems in Borneo, Kalimantan, uh, Sumatra, uh, everywhere. So we need to protect that system. Then we have a very big problem back home, and that is the separation of ministries, uh, funds, etc. I mean, it may, may look very, very self-centered, uh, but I can tell you, unless I had been minister both for development and environment, no one had not embarked upon this. For the very simple reason that the Minister of Environment would be responsible for the policies and the Minister of Development for the money. And where is the Minister of Development in the world who will give all the honor, li uh, limelight, everything to another minister? Uh, in an ideal world, it should happen, but it doesn't happen in the real world. So you need to bring m m much more together match bridges in, in domestic policies, leadership from prime ministers and presidents who can bridge these uh, gaps. Otherwise, you will still have a separate world where ministers of development and finance ministers have the money, and those coming to the climate talks, they have all the good intentions, are able to set uh, some policies, but they don't have access to any pot of, uh, of money. This must be bridged simply. These are some of the important lessons. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, save your clapping because um, I'm, I've sworn in blood that I'm going to get our panelists out by 12.30, so that I'm going to do. What you've had today has been a taster of a forthcoming CGD book, Why Forests, Why Now? I'm conscious we haven't answered the detailed question about uh, how these payments work, but uh, Jonah and Francis are here, so please um, have that conversation offline and indeed... I hope those of you who, who can stay and mingle and ask each, and continue this conversation will do so. Um, but for now, I'd like uh, to ask you again to thank all the panel for fantastic contributions and our presenters, uh, not only for their presentations, but for the underlying research and evidence that have, that's gone into this work. Uh, I think it's a really important initiative to, to draw the world's attention to why forests, why now. I hope you will uh, look out for this publication when it comes out. But thank you very much to the panel. <laughs>